yeah, sorry about last night, man. I was under the weather and I didn't want to, I didn't want to get the video. I didn't want to go live without the video being uploaded. So I just stayed up and just hacked my lungs out and just, uh, just grinded like a mofo. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I get it, man. Glad to hear you're feeling better. Yeah, I'm feeling a lot better, man. Thanks for being here. What's up, everybody? What's up? Noam Bruin, Sterling B, Goose Fraba. Is this thing working tonight? Double IPAs. I'm drinking one right now. So we got the Braj out there in Temple, Texas, dude. What's going on? Wow. Cheers. What's up? Here we go, Cheers. man. Cheers. Not grubby, as the Czechs say. What was that? I said not as grubby, as the Czechs say. Prost. Let's go, baby. Um, so uh, for those who are unaware... Tell us about about yourself, Rush. So uh, my name's Andy. I own a tiny Czech lager focused brewery in Temple, Texas. It's called Tanglefoot Brewing. Um, I've been brewing professionally for about 10 years. Yes, sir. I started this brewery two years years ago in my family's barbecue restaurant. And now it's officially just my brewery. Right on, brother. Yeah, we've been following your channel. I've been following your channel for a while now. And you've got an emphasis on the Czech lager, yeah? Yes, sir. That's in the motto, bringing Czech lager to Temple, Texas? Yeah, so, yeah, I guess the, the kind of the quick snippet is, like, trying to grow this beer brand to be the go-to beer of Temple. Right on, man. So what were you – you said you were working commercially before that. What was the brewery you were at? Cheers, Andy. Cheers, right, brother. It was in – yeah, cheers. In uh, Austin, Texas, called Black Star Co-op. Okay. Um, Alias was talking about making it out there. He lives in Austin. How long is, how far of a drive is that? It is an hour. Exactly. Door oh, to door. shit, East dude. From where I live, I live in Austin. Okay, that's mellow. Shit, so you got to commute one hour each way? Same as Sunset Hound. He might even be closer yeah, to you. So, uh, I'm from Temple originally, so I have family that uh, live here still. So I stay up here a couple nights a week when I run service. Okay, so you're... The family barbecue is still existing or it went out of business or you kind of inherited it or? Yeah, they closed down in uh, December. Okay. Was that kind of a COVID thing, a post-COVID vibe? Yeah. Yes, mostly. Yeah. Uh, COVID definitely wasn't a help for restaurants, but it was, uh, yeah, it was tough the last couple of years there. So they decided to go ahead and shut it down. No, and I hear you. There's a lot of places in San Diego where you just don't get food to go. You know, when COVID was a thing, sure, you can get pizzas to go. You can get burritos and Mexican food to go. Um, but a lot of people, I only go there to sit down. You know, I don't, I don't go to barbecue yeah. places to get food to go. I go there because I want the experience. I want to drink there. I want to watch a game there. I want to spend a lot of money there. And it sounds like that was kind of the establishment that your your folks had. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. So I'm sorry to hear about that, man. It. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's all good. They had a good run. 54 years. So. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. That's cool that you were able to keep the building. Yeah, so my grandmother, so the, the barbecue was called Al's Barbecue Barn, and uh, Al was my grandfather. My grandmother still owns the property, and I rent it from her. So okay. I started started that in the back little closet. In fact, I can just, if I don't know if you want to see a little. Yeah, you want to give us the MTV crib tour? Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to my crib, y'all. This is yeah. where I make all the lager. Yeah, um, that's all the so time we have. You walk Get in the, the hell building, out. There we go. To the, uh, to the left is the beer saloon, as I called it. Uh, so the lighting in here is terrible. So no, it looks good in here, but, um, but the, the bar, I built this bar, uh, by hand, uh, a bunch of reclaimed wood wow. painted the building and, uh, cleaned it up and yeah. Little Dude, that looks killer, man. There. No, the next yeah, time we come out to great. Austin, we're there, man. No questions asked. Uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. This is cool, man. Uh, we got the barrages in here right now. What's up, Jaggers? What's up, man? Brewing bad. We'll get Gnome on here in a little bit. Jerry Woodward. What's up, Raj? Thanks to everybody who watched new Homebrew Fly video. It's doing really well. I appreciate that. Um, shout out to everybody who was here last week. We got a lot of love and the membership. We got a link to this guy's YouTube channel. I put your YouTube channel in here and not your homepage. Is that cool? I was hoping oh, we nice. could get a couple of subscribers out of that. There's a lot of love in here. These guys support yeah, absolutely. the channel like shit. I don't, I don't see the chat um, on my screen. So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or anything, just let me know. I can read them out to you. I'll read the questions to you. Do you have a computer in there, though, where you could put on YouTube or put on a TV on? Let me, I can take your time, man. I can shoot the yeah. shit with the chat. Yeah, I got the uh, the old iPad. Perfect. Yeah, anything works, man. Thanks, Jaggers. Much love, Raj. Sunset in the house. Yeah, I love all these little dookies up here, too. No, brewing bad. Sunset. Cheers, Raj boy, Ben. What's up? 
Yeah, sorry about last night. I know I don't like taking the Wednesdays off. I just was under the weather. I didn't want to put the video out without... Um, I could have put the video out yesterday and I emailed Yakima Valley and I was like, you know what? It just needs another night of carbonating at 20 PSI. A lot of these videos get rushed and the beers look like shit at the end. And I was like, nah, I just need like one decent carbonated beer and I want to put it out there and I want to get my studio lights on it because I never have like the good lighting shots of beers. And I was like, I'll just put this video out on Thursday. And they were like, no problem at all, man. Take your time. James Churchill. Oh, I'm drinking my double IPA, man. This is the bent gate recipe. I mean, it's an altered version. I think that their dry hops were, it wasn't Citra and Eldorado. I think it was like Mosaic and Sabro or something, but same everything up until like their five day dry hop, they went into like a seven or a 10. And I was like, I can't do that for a YouTube video. I got to, you know, my last video was like 40 days ago. For- I got the. Got the stream up now. You got the stream up here, man. James Churchill, what's up, dog? Yeah, man. All the odds. It's one hour from you. He actually lives in Austin, small ass world. So it's all easier for you just to go hang out with all the odds than for him to um, schlep out there. Could you do what half the week in Austin? Um, Yeah, a little more, a little less some weeks. I'm here Thursday, Friday, Saturday, one to eight p.m. So definitely here for service all of those days, and then nice man. Need a brew or package or anything. Do you sleep at the brewery? Uh, no, I that'd don't. be awesome. Uh, definitely been, yeah, definitely something I've considered, but uh, not very hospitable in this, you know, close to a hundred year old building. Yeah, but if you, you know, if you can heat up water and there's a drain close by, that means you can shower, you know. But um, I don't know if you want to go that caveman approach, but uh, that'd be cool for maybe one week. But after that, I'm sure you'd get pretty burned out on it. Yeah. Do you still work at Black Star Sunset Hound? Nope. I left, uh, left Black Star about, uh, well, last August, so almost a year. So you were doing a year owning this, and then you would do a little bit commercial stuff part-time for that last year? Because you said you've been owning this for, what, two years? Yeah, so I opened in uh, April of 21, okay. and I was only open one day a week, uh, still full-time at Black Star. Then I opened two days a week, still, a, uh, still full-time at Black Star. And then I left last August and then came on three days a week here. Living the dream, man. How many employees do you have over there at Tanglefoot? None. That's awesome. So you're doing all the beer tending as well? Everything. So if you're brewing or something and a customer comes in, do you have to run and stop and go tend to them and then go back? Or No, no I don't brew on days that I'm open. You don't brew on... Got it. Okay. So when you're open, no one's brewing and you're solely behind the bar or you're cleaning yeah. or doing something. Yeah. When I'm in service, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's 100% front of house serving people. And then any of the other days is production. When did you go from one day open to three days open? You said Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but Sunday you're closed? Yeah. Yeah. So I went from one day to two days in probably late 2021 and then did that up until last August when I left Blackstar and had an extra day to be able to, because I was, I mean, when I built this place, I'm a James uh, Churchill. I mean, I built the bar, but when I built Tanglefoot, I was all on my time that I wasn't working at, at Blackstar. So I'd, I'd clock out there drive up an hour north, do construction on the bar until like nine o'clock at night and then drive back home. Man. And that was like, and then the, in the first year of being open with two days, uh, it was, you know, basically six, seven days a week of work. So. Insanity. Uh, if you could do it all over again, what's the first thing you would recommend to a younger two year old version of yourself to your oh, younger man. version? A lot of stuff. Um, maybe, I don't know. I did things kind of the way I wanted at a slow pace, but definitely like understanding that you need capital in order to to continue to grow in this industry. So that's something I'm working on a video right now, but uh, that's something that I'm really struggling with because I, I started the brewery with just savings. So open this, this will be a little insight into the video. I opened the brewery initially with about um, uh, $2,000 homebrew equipment. So that was my whole brewing system was on a one barrel a homebrew system that I was double mashing to knock out one barrel of work. And then I built out the bar for another, you know, 5,000 or something like that. So less than $10,000 to open a brewery because I tagged on to an existing business. And then when I scaled up the second time, the new equipment was like 25 grand and I had just enough to cover that much uh, uh, scaling, but that was pretty much it depleted all my funds. And now I'm at a point where I need to scale up again and you so now debt, investors, those type of things come into play. So having money at the start is always a good idea. 
um, and and also tempering expectations. I've been extremely humbled by this experience. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, Thirty three. That's awesome, man. So okay, so have you looked to family for like a non um, interest family loan, or has that ship sailed, or is that not even there? I mean, I've definitely had some uh, money from family that has helped me out through this. So that's been super invaluable because otherwise I probably wouldn't be here. And then the, the opportunity of being able to open here is like 100% predicated on my family having this business. Sure. Like I couldn't have just like popped up in another restaurant without having a really deep relationship with somebody. So definitely like had all the connections and uh, leg up to be able to start this in the first place. So are you gonna deal with banks now or are you gonna actually just reach out to investors and be like, hey, here's you know X amount of equity, I need X amount of dollars. I mean, that's a whole kind of thing think, I've never done. I think, yeah, I think banks, unfortunately, uh, I don't I feel, I'm super uncomfortable with, with taking out debt because you know I, I don't, I haven't proven that I can use these funds to like rapidly grow the business yet but it is something I'm kind of leaning towards just taking out a loan. Right on, man. Um, nothing too crazy, but. Well, here's the thing. If we can get some, um, I don't know, some subscribers over there to your channel, if you guys want to support them, there's a link in the bio. Maybe that'll get a couple of feet in the door, maybe one day, you know, and um, yeah, you know, people showing up, you know, and buying draft beer is the best way to, this thing crept out. Uh, is is the biggest margin for a brewery to have, you know, so especially there's a, you know, there's a lot of people that brew, um, you know, Texas is a huge club. I, like, I didn't know the temple was that close to Austin, but the next time I'm in Austin, like I'm for damn sure. We, me, all he doesn't know. I'm like, no questions asked. We're coming out there. Yeah, for sure. Got a question here. Appreciate that, Matt. Hey, I love both these dudes. Cheers. Cheers. Kurt Pick. What's up, dog? Kurt Pick says ballsy. I agree. But, you know, sometimes a man in his dreams are bigger than, everything dating girls yeah going back to college <laughs> having a kid sometimes you know james churchill what challenges did you have with scaling up other than financially how was the transition between your small setup to the kit that you're currently on and i got a question too what are you scaling up to like a three barrel yeah uh, that's what i'm currently uh, i have a uh, four barrel you got a four barrel tank. okay but um so you went from one to four system. to what I, I went to a one barrel system, home literal homebrew system, uh, to the four barrel, uh, four barrel system. So two fermentation vessels, two bright tanks, and an indoor glycol unit. And now my uh, scaling up from there would most likely be separate, uh, independent cold liquor tank, an oversized cold liquor tank because of the loggers, uh, a bigger glycol unit, and probably one or two seven barrel tanks. So I could keep the hot side of the, the process and then just double batch. Got it. Okay, so okay. that's makes it a lot easier if you're keeping the kettle in there. Mm -hmm. So I like this, I love all this, man. So you're a one man show. Is that the name of the game? Is it to always remain a one man show? Or would you eventually like to have production assistants or you know good looking beer tenders or knowledgeable beer tenders? Or is it kind of just, this is how it's gonna be? Question. Yeah, that's a good question. In the short term, definitely me by myself. Uh, I'm, I'm going through a, a period right now of kind of like some uh, deep introspection about uh, what I want this business to be. Mm -hmm. So I initially got into craft beer, loving beer, wanting to brew beer and, give it, and serving it to people. And now I'm super interested on building a great business. And this industry is, you know, kind of pretty notorious for these businesses not being amazing. Uh, distribution's kind of a racket. It's pretty difficult and challenging, low margin. But so I'm trying to find what it, exactly I want. So I wanna grow the on-site sales. I wanna grow the tap room, uh, but I'd also like to scale production so that I can send beer to places that really want Tanglefoot, not necessarily, um, you know, just be like the number one beer in the, <laughs> in the state. I'd like to have it be curated where this beer goes because Obviously, with YouTube and people that love check specific breweries, I've had tons of people reach out to me asking if they can get kegs or cans. So that would be a focus. Uh, and then if that happens, I would definitely need to bring on some more people. But it kind of seems like you're trying to have like a boutique uh, approach, kind of like wineries up in Napa. Some of them weren't all about trying to, you know, get their beer into, or wine into every grocery store and get their champagne everywhere. It was kind of like, yeah. you come to come to us. This is kind of special. 
we're just this two-story beautiful house off Silverado Trail or whatnot. Um, that's kind of all we need. This is kind of all we want. Is that is there kind of a cool like thieves hideout kind of club to know about your place? Or are you really trying to? I mean, it's really going to be difficult to grow in in any which way with one person. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is the. I guess my biggest goal would be like, regardless of size or scale would just be to be able to have this be a profitable, uh, good business that is scalable, whether I want to do it or not. And then cross that bridge when I get to it. Like if I get to the next where I, where I scale the equipment and I get to, you know, sending half of the beer out in distribution and tap room sales increase and I'm selling the other half on site and like money's coming in, but there's no profit to be had at the end of the day, yeah. then, you know, that's, that is not, that's not good. Right. So I, I'd like to build the best version of that business and the scale is kind of irrelevant at this point. I like that. And you know what, you kind of remind me of me, you know, um, I could tell you right now, you're probably like, I'm single. I've got no kids. That's why I'm, I can kind of be crazy with working 60 hour weeks and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sure you're probably working more. Um, cause I don't think the things that you do that you're doing, the thing that I'm doing is possible. If you have a significant, I'm not, I have no idea whether you're single or if you have kids or not, but this would be even more impossible to understand if you had kids. Is that? Yeah, no kids, but I do have an awesome girlfriend, Jody. I don't you, know if she's on the stream or not, but shout, shout out, out to Jody. Jody. Shout out to Jody. Cause a lot of significant others would be like hard. No, fuck. No, we're breaking up. Bottom line. Yeah. I mean, but also another thing you mentioned, like a, uh, whether I'm, I'm working more than you, I don't working like crazy hours. I think a lot of people look at what I'm doing and they're like, Oh man, you're doing all this stuff. Like you're, you're running the tap room and you're brewing beer. It's like, yeah, man, I get to make beer and I want to sell it to people. Like, it's not like it's a, it's a burden. Uh, so, I mean, I work longer hours some weeks and then some weeks I have four days off in a row. Cause I'm only, I can't brew and I'm only open three days. So it's not insane. Okay. So the things that I'm pursuing are interesting to me. They are very interesting. I like this a lot. So you're open Thursday, Friday, you're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you're closed Sunday through Wednesday. Are you brewing Sunday through Wednesday or do you brew one day a week or twice yeah, a week? It would be one day every, every like other week because uh, of the, the way the system is. So I, the loggers that I brew take three weeks in primary at a minimum. Okay. So there I have two fermentation vessels. So one of them, brew a beer into that three weeks in that tank the other one next week brew in that three weeks in that tank so i can't brew into the first tank until at a minimum two weeks after the second brew so there are gaps within production um and the beers take about two months to make so my whole like the amount of beer that i can make on the system that i currently have is only about 100 barrels okay. per year which is like nothing okay and if i if i brewed ales i could brew like 300 or 400 barrels of beer Okay, so you're doing primarily Czech Pilsners, and you're doing, are you doing any IPAs or anything? Cause, because those, do, just, they don't not, take two months to so, brew. Yeah, no, not just Pilsners, but exclusively Czech lagers. So this is the menu right here. Um, it's a traditional way of uh, naming beer in the Czech Republic. So the numbers on the, uh, well, my, the left here correspond to the starting sugar content of the wort. Okay. Tr- oh, yeah, tr- um, so the higher the number, the higher the strength of the beer. Uh, so 10 degree on top, pale lager, that's like a light pilsner. 12 degree in the middle, pale lager is a medium strength or premium check pilsner. So they're all lagers that take two months. And oh, you know, I wouldn't be brewing any IPAs or any other styles that are outside of like traditional check lagers. Okay, so this is very niche. This is very boutique. I, kn- I knew you were doing check lagers, but I thought that was just maybe like half the menu. I thought you were doing, you know, the, the more popular western styles if you will american styles if you will but it's just that i like it so tell me about the two-month process with the lagering i mean do you have the vertical tanks is it i'm sorry the horizontal tanks or is Uh, it no i actually have two the two fermentation vessels are cylindroconical so they're they're vertical but they're pretty stout so it's it's not um they're not like super tall and skinny okay and then after the primary fermentation they're transferred to one of the bright tanks, which then the 
majority of not even the majority a couple more weeks of lagering happen in the bright tank and then i finish the aging in kegs okay damn okay so all your beers take two months yep crazy i've never heard of that i've never heard of a brewery that does that and only does that for four or five different beers yeah, they got them all over the place. They're in the Czech Republic. Okay, so what's the difference between dark and, and light? I mean, what else is kind of going into them? What are the what are the hops that you're using from this versus that versus? Uh, ex- exclusively Czech Saz uh, for okay. all the hopping. Uh, the base malt for all of them is Pilsner malt. The 10 degree and the 12 degree pale lager are the exact same uh, ingredients, just in different proportions. Uh, 12 proportion. degree that's actually what i'm drinking right here okay uh this is the 12 degree pale lager the premium czech pilsner so this has more of an emphasis on the uh, the hops in the beer okay so it's a lot more aromatic and and has a lot of hop character from late edition hop uh late late boil edition uh hops and then the 13 degree tamave is a dark lager so think about like the color of a stout but uh nice balanced and easy drinking like a five percent lager so when you say 12 12- it's a 12 on your scale. What is that in ABV for us in layman's terms? So 12, 12 degree, uh, Play-Doh. Play-Doh would be. Is the, Play-Doh, 12 degree Play-Doh would be like 1052 specific gravity. Okay. And everything finishes at what? 1010? No, no, it's completely different. But here's interesting, uh, tidbit about Czech loggers. Um, they they especially with this yeast strain they finish much higher than you would expect so the 12 degree pale lager finishes at about you know three to three and a half degrees play-doh which would be you know 10 14 okay so i'm gonna do that in my head i'm gonna call it like a 4.5 percent beer uh it's about five percent okay yeah the 12 is about five the 13 is about five and the 10 is about uh four percent so interesting well, I do know this. I think you do have the most popular style. Not the most popular style, but I think you have the best style going for Texas as far as it being hot as shit out there because all of your oh, styles yeah, of yeah, beer sure. are delicious. You know, like everyone likes the barrel aid stuff and the, st- the stuff that sits around. I like that stuff too, but the problem about that stuff, it sits around. It sits around. Yeah. yeah. Typically, it's like a yeah, Christmas indeed. thing or an anniversary thing for a lot of places because they don't want to deal with it year round. So if you just do it and, you know, quick impulses, it's our anniversary. We did a hundred. Uh, maybe we can sell these all. And sometimes they don't. A lot of times, you know, yeah. there's a lot of leftovers. Sometimes you can get like leftovers from two, three, four years ago. So <laughs> as far as the style you're going for, man, that's awesome. I would, I would love to have, I would love to come out and try your beer now. I mean, when did, okay. So you yeah. commercial brewer forever. Did you start at commercial brewing or were you a home brewer before that? Oh yeah, definitely a homebrewer before that. So my long story is I, uh, so you were like 21, 22. School, um, uh, yeah, well actually 20, but I graduated high school, went to culinary school for pastry, tra- uh, went to a couple of different places, uh, to work in pastry. The last one being Scottsdale, Arizona. Mm. While I was working in a restaurant in Scottsdale. I, uh, found craft beer, had a coworker that showed me how to homebrew and then turned 21 and then went crazy with craft beer, moved back to Austin to be around a good beer scene, and then started going to this brew pub, Black Star Co-op, got a job front of house, quickly transitioned into the brewery when a position opened up, and then uh, took over as head brewer in 2015. That's awesome, man. That's really awesome. So let's rewind the clock. You got into the craft beer scene probably like 2008, nine, kind of before? 2011. 2011, kind of before it was cool, because craft beer wasn't really cool, cool in San Diego until about 2013. That was when, if there was was a new brewery, like you had to go. We didn't do that two years, three years, four years, five years before that. Like I went to school up at Sonoma State, and we would go to like Sierra Nevada and stuff, but everybody did that. You kind of had to do that. It wasn't like, hey, let's track down this local brewery in this business park behind a street that's no one's ever been on, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you were into it before the kind of the, the whole gold rush vibe started. Which was interesting because and I, and you're underage. <laughs> yeah. Initially I was, that's, that's but, a cool uh, story period, but I, uh, yeah, I started home brewing. I brewed two batches of extract, uh, beer and then immediately was like, I'm, I have to all grain. And so I, I just fell in love with the process and the science behind it. And so when I moved to Austin, moved into a house and then was finally able to buy some equipment and 
moving from Scottsdale back to Austin was an interesting experience because I was like, oh, Austin's a great beer town. There's a bunch of breweries that are there, probably like maybe eight <laughs> at the time or 10 maybe. Yeah. And then, uh, but I was spoiled in Scottsdale. That's like a weird uh, little oasis for craft beer because it got all the stuff in California. Okay. But it also got the Colorado stuff and, you know, some East Coast stuff as well. So I had access to, I was drinking like, I was drinking Sculpin and Odell and um, some local stuff like Santan Brewing, but just got really, really uh, exposed to some awesome beer out there. And I think about Scottsdale that people don't realize uh, I think I know a lot of people that went to Scottsdale or went to U of A or whatever. Is it U of A or is it Tempe or ASU? What's the college? Tempe is ASU. It's yeah, ASU? Tempe's ASU. So I knew a lot of people that went there from San Diego, but it is a big, big party town. And craft breweries oh, yeah. love that shit, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like the desert, uh, kind of like how Boulder is for like the mountains and stuff like that. Just big, big, big party town. So, I mean, that was cool right there, right time. Um, i I mean, I've driven through Scottsdale a bunch of times, but I was never really like an Arizona or a kind of New Mexico guy. I, I was just always, um, I don't know, I live by the coast. I like the beach, but I've had friends that went to really college. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things. Like one of my best friends is like my yeah. two favorite cities are Scottsdale, Arizona and uh, Charleston, South Carolina, which I've yet to go to <laughs> as well. But um, this dude's definitely, definitely a reliable source. But that's a trip, man. That's definitely a trip. What do you think the biggest brewery out there is in Scotland or uh, Scotland? Scottsdale. Scotland, I don't know, but uh, Scottsdale. <sighs> it's a territory. Peaks, probably. Never heard of it. Yeah, I mean, they're not in Scottsdale proper, but uh, well, in, in uh, shoot, where Arizona Wilderness is a brew pub that is either they're close to Scottsdale. They're like a, a pretty well-known brew pub out there. But Four Peaks is, is they might be out of Tempe, but they're a pretty large brewery. I get them all confused. Tempe is ASU. That's Sun Devils. Yeah. And uh, the Wildcats are Scottsdale. Yes. Bear down. Bear down. That's their whole thing. They, they mm-hmm. call it bear down. I don't know why. They're not the Bears. They're the Wildcats. But okay. anyway, that's awesome. Do you remember your system? Do you remember when you, I mean, when you did the transition from two extract to all grain? Was it the Home Depot cooler? No, it was um, – Because that was when people well, – it was a, 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 a like an igloo cooler was the mash tun, but right. the kettle was the kettle was a turkey fryer for sure. Nice. Um, did it have a then, spigot? Yeah, like a, yeah, yeah. It did have a spigot. It was a it was an awful spigot. It was a pla- It was plastic. It was it was chrome plated plastic. I remember that. Brutal, brutal. Yeah. Um, let me um. Uh, I'm going to go fill up another beer. I'm going to try to drink all of my double IPA for all the Oz and Gnome coming to town so they can't have any. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, do you mind holding it down? You got the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll show the folks. They, uh, I'm going to pour another beer. I'll show you uh, how I make uh, pour Czech style beer. Well, hold on. I want to see that. Can you wait for me? Okay, sure. <laughs> with the uh, with the Luker taps, L-U-K-R? Yeah, I'll, yeah and I'll, I'll answer some questions in the chat. Okay. The $500 taps, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah, get, 400 but 400 Okay, I'll be right back. Yeah. All right, so we got – who was it? I know J- – I'm going back, but I know James asked about challenges with scaling up. Uh, how was the transition between the small setup to the kit I'm currently on? Uh, it was fine. This system that I have is very manual and kind of homebrewy, so all the principles still applied, just dealing with a bigger pump. And, uh, yeah, I had a heat, heat exchanger on the other system as well, so nothing too crazy. Um, what do you – this is Kurt Pick. Shout out. Uh, what do you want to do next time to improve your place in this? What do you want to do next to improve uh, your place in this crowded market? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I Something about me doesn't want to. I don't want to do the same thing that everybody does. And probably the same thing There's the reason that I got into craft beer to begin with is that it was kind of cool and interesting and unique and kind of allowed me to channel all of my interests like, you know, artistic, uh, creative creativity, uh, but also science and analytical thinking into one business. So now I think just really focusing on my niche and, and trying to get beer out to people. And honestly, I'd like to do some pop-ups. I really think that'd be cool to have like a mobile check logger brewery pop-up that I could take across, you know, the state or hey, even the country. If I get enough folks in uh, Nebraska and they want me to come out there and do a pour, that'd be dope. 
Um, come on. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll through here. Uh, how far did the one barrel system get me? Uh, I hear a lot of brewers say skip the one barrel system and go bigger if you can. That's absolutely tr uh, good advice, but the one barrel system was a uh, necessity. When I started this concept, it started with me, one, I had the opportunity to tag on to the existing license of the family barbecue restaurant. So it was like super easy way to start a brewery. And the second uh, reason is that I wanted to test my theory. I wanted to see if this town was receptive to such a unique specific beer experience. So, uh, but it got me one year and then I had to scale up. And honestly, if I was doing it just as a business, there's no way to make money with one barrel system unless you have a ton of fermentation vessels. So it's like, doesn't matter that you're brewing one beer at a time if you brew 10 batches a month, then you have 10 barrels in uh, capacity. Do you do any of the, uh, the homebrew store stuff, the local homebrew store, or not even close? Uh, as far as what, like, like, like getting ingredients? Yeah, do you sell stuff? I know that there's a lot of small breweries out there, not like Genus Brewing, but there was a couple in San Diego that had one barrel systems that also pushed homebrew products, just sold, you know, hops by the ounce or two or. No, I don't do that, but I, I, well, I have something that I'm working on, but I'm not going to announce it. Yet. Don't do it. No. Like before we talked about it, I was like, can I ask you anything? You're like, yeah, go for oh, it. But there's always something there. Yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I can ask Whatever and you I can just do. shut it down. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Good choice of words. But uh, that was Peter from Genesis Big Dang. Somebody asked him, they're like, hey, do you, what's your best advice to open up, um, you know, a brewery that sells ingredients? He was like, the best advice is just don't do it. Just don't even do it, you know. And um, I have worked at a place where yeah. I don't want this to kill any idea or kill any dreams. But I worked at a place with a one barrel system and it was a bar. And sometimes the bar got busy and then people would want to come in and ask about home brewing. Hey, I want to switch from extract to all grade. What do I do? And they would talk for half an hour. They would ask 21 questions and then not buy anything, you know, and you've got 10 yeah. people in line that want to buy a seven, eight dollar pint right then and there on your best margins, you know, and it wasn't worth yeah. it to have another guy on just to answer questions. Like he just, the owner couldn't afford the labor on California with, you know, I think minimum wage was like 16 bucks an hour at that time, maybe 15. I don't know, but it was just a lot. Um, not trying to, you know, rain on anyone's parade, but, um, no, but I think these conversations are good. And I feel like that a lot. I feel like I, I come off as like a negative Nancy a lot of times because I, I'm Join the club. Hated, been in this uh, industry for a while. But like if you I didn't listen to any advice before I got into this industry, even though I heard uh, however many interviews from brewer, brewers that were like, oh, yeah, the industry's tough. It's a lot of cleaning. It's all this stuff. Just like don't do it. And then I got in the industry and I was like, yeah, you clean. Right. It's like part of it. It's but not a big deal. You clean so your house, you clean your dishes. There's always cleaning. Like, fuck. Yeah. L listen, like, I can only speak for myself and my experience. Like, a lot of this shit is hard. Um, there's not a ton. Like, it's distribution is a difficult aspect of the industry. Uh, that It's pretty low margins. There's not a ton of money. It's a very capital intense business. Sure. So you have to continually throw money in mm -hmm. order to grow and you don't realize profits for years. So like all those are challenges, but if you're up for it and you get to brew beer for a living, then fuck it. I like it, man. And you know, I just, uh, I had Adam makes beer on a couple of weeks ago and we talked about when your brewery does get big enough, you know, you don't sell out, but a distribution comes in and they want to move your product for you. And we were talking about the canning line thing, like the reality of the labor on a canning line for one guy versus two guys versus four guys and how the brewery has to pay for that, you know, because canning lines could go up to $150,000. I mean, they can go up to a million dollars at a, you know, oh, Sierra yeah, Nevada yeah. scale. But I, I was looking back and I looked at the video like a week later. I was like, the number one thing we didn't even talk about was right under our nose the whole time. And we didn't even say it. The distributor is going to take 30%. You know, so if you're going to yeah. sell a $220 keg out your brewery, you can sell it for 220 bucks, sell it to a bar, you know, they'll make $700 on it. What is it? Um, how many 140 or how many 16 yeah, ounce like pints? 120, 16 ounce pints, assuming that, you know, the beer is pouring good no and stuff loss. like that. And they'll make yeah. $700 on that. But if you have someone pick that up for you, what's 30% of $200, 60 bucks. That's a lot of money. They take 30 fucking percent. Yeah, and it's, but the, yeah, 
on top of the it's not, it's not that they take 30 well it's no they do 30 percent of your it's not 30 percent of the revenue that they take it's you sell them a pro like you could sell the keg to the distributor for 220 but then it's priced in the market at 30 percent above that so Got it's it. not that they're like taking it away they're just doing the work of like facilitating the logistics and you set your price but like if you want that to land at a 220 dollars keg yeah, you're going to sell it for 30% less than if you self-distributed it. But the flip side of that is self-distributing the beer is often more expensive than sending it through a distributor anyways. You just don't realize it because you, like, you're like, you like, I'm saving the 30%, but you're paying for trucks, gas, uh, labor. time for a sales rep to go out. Yeah, the labor, the insurance, insurance on the vehicle. Insurance on yeah, the employee, so insurance on the vehicle. Moving yeah. heavy liquids is a, a tough business. It's a tough business. You got a couple of good questions here from James Churchill and Zeb Maloney. What's up, man? Uh, we'll go with yeah. uh, James and and uh, first come, first serve order. Do you have your own house well, yeast? I've never used a lager yeast before, but planning on for my next brew. What does a house yeast mean? I don't know what that means. Just like a proprietary strain. No, it's a 2278 uh, check fills from Y yeast. Okay. Uh, I mean, pri proprietary yeast to me seems like White Labs. Like you're, you know, it's like a Jurassic yeah, no, Park I, thing back there, like a little observatory where you're hanging out, making little, you know, fake dinosaurs come to life and stuff like that. But um, yeah, how many times do you uh, use a yeast? How many generations will you do before you just uh, pitch a new? Is it liquid or dry? The one you just mentioned. Liquid. Okay, so how many yeah, times will you on use this that? system? This system, I'll usually only have to go like three to five generations because the way that the, at black star with ales we would go up to like 10 generations right here because my fermentation time is so long it's like a generation of yeast can last me six months okay. so it's not really like uh, it's important to keep it going but i don't i usually don't go past five okay this is a short answer i like that okay um, Zeb Maloney, how did you land on the Czech niche? Is it your favorite style? Is it your favorite? Did you win some awards? Was it, um, how'd this come across? Nope. Never brewed a Czech lager in my life before I started the concept. Interesting. So I, it, yeah, this is actually, this is a story I don't tell much. So uh, get some insight for your viewers. Uh, I, I'm, I have Czech heritage. Temple, Texas is a, uh, it's in a County called Bell County big Czech population. So I was like, I want to focus on loggers. I knew that. And I was like, let's focus on Czech loggers. It's cool. It's got some, you know, historical context and cultural context in the area. So focus on that. I thought I knew what Czech loggers were and I did. I, I started the project, brewed a test batch and was like, this is different than I assumed. And then just like fell in love with the beers. Just, I fell in love with the beer culture, the way that the, the beers poured the emphasis on foam, the serving, the everything about it, I just fell in love with. So I started brewing these beers and then just kind of became obsessed with them and then opened the concept and yeah, haven't, haven't deviated. I like it, man. That's awesome. Warren Cox. Hey, what's up, Barrages? Didn't realize it was moved from yesterday to today. Yeah, kind of a last minute thing. Um, it's always been on Wednesday, but um, just couldn't get it out. I wanted to do it. I was feeling like shit. I talked to um, Andy yesterday he was cool about it i like, kind of lost my voice i was feeling weird doing voiceover and stuff like that but we're all here tonight um and it's working out it's, it's going good so i got a question how does the youtube channel come into play is it all about kind of just drawing exposure to the brand or have you always wanted to have a youtube channel kind of like bent gates or yeah, I, i've always wanted a youtube channel and uh, actually i started a youtube channel years ago when i first got in the industry um, if anybody's interested, it's called craft expertise. It's a, uh, uh, it's a satire beer review channel. It's like really shitty vi videos of me rating beers really poorly. But anyways, so I, w I've always wanted to be on YouTube. Craft expertise. Craft, <laughs> craft expertise. Well, I'm going to see my channel blow up from 12 to 13 oh subscribers God. now. Uh, PewDiePie, so step aside, boy. Then, I started it and then immediately got embarrassed about not wanting to look like an idiot in front of my peers and then kind of didn't do anything. And then when I started Tanglefoot, I do, so I do everything. I do all the social media, all the finance stuff, uh, the bookkeeping, I do the production, everything. And I was like, oh man, so I, I should start, um, you know, a podcast. And so I started a podcast and then was like, well, I should 
probably record. I don't know. Everybody does video on podcasts. So I was like, I'll record a podcast. So I started a YouTube channel and then immediately like fell in love with the process again and got nice. into filming stuff and editing stuff and got this super cool app on my phone called InShot that was really accessible and easy to edit videos with. So yeah, I just, I just fell right back into it. Do you get people come in that say, Hey, I found you from watching your YouTube. Yeah, actually. I'd imagine that's a pretty good feeling. It is. I think we may, I don't know if it's an overlap in our viewership, but I had a guy come in from Wisconsin, I think that drove, that was, had a family trip to Austin and drove up an hour to come see me. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I saw somebody comment earlier. I watched one of your videos. I've watched a couple of your videos this week and last. It was about, um, I think you posted this on Instagram too. It was about how IBUs are a scam. And I've said that for a long time. It's all bullshit. <laughs> they I've, don't matter. They yeah. don't matter. And I said that in a claw hammer video and they kind of shunned me on it. It was with Just Brewing and Ross and uh, I don't know. We brewed a hazy IPA. I, we brewed a West Coast IPA. It was the first time I met all those guys. And they asked that this like, what do you think about IBUs? I said, it's just, it's just all bullshit. I mean, it's a good way of kind of knowing it's a good starting point. It's a good starting point, but there's so many multi beers that are like 80, 90, hundred IBUs. And you're like, this did, this doesn't work at all. I thought it was supposed to get more and more bitter, not sweet. So it's got kind of like a, like a, like a fruit, you know, I understand what zero means. I understand what like 40, 50, 60 means. But after that, you kind of like start going kind of, weird with it yeah it's yeah it's it's just a it's one of those metrics it's like it's really good for you to get a baseline knowledge of like this is a thing kind of a marketing tool as well yeah yeah but it's just when it comes to like bitterness and often people describe things as bitter that are not bitter like people describe sour as bitter so right yeah it's, it's kind of a weird thing altogether yeah and it's weird too because i'm you know i I brew a lot of beers i used to brew a lot of beer i used to brew a lot of sours and stuff like that and people you know i've always been front of house at the breweries that i've worked at and they're like hey like what what would you what do you think this sour is i'm like well it's probably like 3.4 and they're like what does that mean i'm like i'm like what do you mean does that mean it's it's the ph of this is like 3.4 they're like no like what is it out of 10 like one through 10 i'm like fuck i don't know like a five like (laughs) i don't know (laughs) It's four sit, you know, right. I can give you the exact answer you want right now, but you know, if you want like a point of reference, I'm not even going to say one through 10. I'm just going to say it's kind of tart, you know, or something like that. All right, here it is. The $400 tap handle. Oh, let's go, good. baby. Yeah. So which one's yeah, this? So, okay. Yeah. Let's do a little inspection first. So these are, uh, Luker taps. Yep. They are manufactured in the Czech Republic. It's a ball valve. So you crack it open a little bit. It creates a lot of foam and you open it up all the way and, you know, good clean beer flows out mm-hmm. the end of the nozzle. So I'm going to pour another beer. I'm going to pour 10 degree pale lager. So this is the kind of baby brother of the 12 degree that I just had. Okay. It's be light, easy drinking. So crack the tap, get the foam going, put the glass underneath, fill the glass up about a third of the way, and then open the tap. Is that how they do it in Czech Republic? Is that why all the, their beers taste a lot creamier? I'm getting drunk, by the way, too. This 8.3% beer. It's going to fuck me up. Yeah, and this so, is only my second beer. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. This is my first beer in four days. So Really? Or cheers, man. Yeah. Dude, the people that grind yeah, the cheers. hardest in the beer industry don't drink a lot. Like Adam makes beer. I don't think the guy from Treehouse drinks a lot. You can't be hung over and working your ass off. You just can't. Well, Especially if you want to be I in front of camera. Four day break. I took a four day break because of the opposite of that. <laughs> so Opposite yeah, of what? It's, uh, you run a bender? I mean, did I? Yeah, I mean, just like I find myself around alcohol constantly. Yeah. Uh, so it's always nice to take a little little siesta. Yeah. Well, right on, man. Cheers to a four day one. And uh, mm-hmm. is that your, how many beers have you had tonight? This is the second one. Okay. So you're on two and four days. That's not bad at all, man. The name of this is yep. can we keep it to like three or four tonight without, uh, you know, waking up with a hangover to have enough discipline yeah. and have enough fun, but still not pay for it in the morning. Sometimes I can learn that and sometimes it's impossible for me to learn kind of just depends on what you're doing and who you're with what if is this a video for ends dude that- i we're just getting uh timmy down here i don't know if he's uh showing love or trolling but to me it's all the same um yeah 
I've been doing that for a while and I thought about making a video on that. I'm, you know, I'm sure I've talked about this on there, but I, I don't, I mean, I do want to make fun of stuff, you know, like breast cancer has like walk for a cure, make like a YouTube video. It's like all these guys are getting together, you know, trying to figure out how to raise money and we go on a walk and we're trying to find like, um, you know, donate all this money to, um, hangover research you know like can they come up with a pill or something i think it'd be a good thing if it's done right i think anything's a good idea if it's done right um but yeah Maybe man, somebody we're, will be working on that soon in the beer industry everyone's got kind of something everyone's going like, this kind of works or this kind of works or this guy's lying about how he doesn't get hangovers it's like nah if you drink enough you're gonna get hungover i mean i don't know because there is have you ever met somebody who just doesn't get hung over and you've actually seen them in the morning and they're like ship shape, ready to go, like cooking breakfast and coffee at seven in the morning. You're like, dude, I'm going to go put a yeah. bolt in my fucking head and you're like going to do a 12 hour day unless they're doing something. Yeah. I don't know, like ripping, you know, nose rips or I don't even think Adderall would work at that point. I think it would have to be like straight to cocaine. Oh, that's so, why you never get hangovers. Oh, because you have a lot of money. Here's a fun fact. Snort drugs. So I, I may or may not be working on this. Uh, but one we of found, the... We the found the cure. We found the yeah. cure. <laughs> we walked the, for it. The, we walked to the corner store at four in the morning behind the uh, dumpster yeah. and met the guy. <laughs> yeah. He was out back slinging. Yeah. Uh, so the guy. The, the primary cause of hangovers is not uh, dehydration like a lot of people think. I, it's actually acid aldehyde. Okay. Because the dehydration thing is... compound that we all know about in beer. Yep. uh, Because it's produced in yeast fermentation. And so what happens is you put yeast in beer, beer eats the sugar, sugar uh, gets converted into um, acid aldehyde that gets converted into ethanol. You drink the beer, Mm -hmm. the ethanol goes into your body, your liver breaks ethanol down into diacetyl, and then uh, your body will then break down the acid, or I'm sorry, into acid aldehyde, not diacetyl, I misspoke. And then your body will slowly break down acid aldehyde. But the reason you feel fatigue, nausea, headaches, all that stuff the next day is because you have an overabundance of acid aldehyde in your system. And so the, the answer is, how do we break down the acid aldehyde quicker? I like that, because I, I never knew, I, I, I didn't never know, but I always thought that the dehydration thing was bullshit, because... There's been so many times where I had a lot to drink and I would just go home and chug water, chug water to the point where I would throw up and I yeah. would wake up and I'd be hung over as hell. I'm like that. I drank more water than fucking anybody on planet earth today. It should yeah. have balanced out the alcohol and it didn't like this dehydration yeah. thing is a myth. All these little pills it's, that they want to sell. A factor. Like you, it's All definitely these... a factor. Cause like if you're dehydrated, regardless of drinking alcohol, you still kind of feel like lethargic and slow because you're not, you're just not hydrated. It feels bad, but yeah, not the primary cause. Do you get bad hangovers? You're coming not into often. the age, 33, 34, you're coming yeah, into the age, often, man. But more, Welcome more aboard. so recently, yeah. Yeah, usually it's something, this is interesting. Usually it'll be from, like I, I drink beer constantly especially like these beers i can drink you know six seven eight of them and you know feel pretty normal i I also drink a lot of whiskey i really like whiskey so i can sit down with a few bourbons at the end of the night and wake up you know feeling okay but if i drink like if i go to a bar and i drink no no if i go to like a dive bar and it's later i usually go to bed at 10 o'clock but if i go to a dive bar at nine o'clock and i'm out till midnight and i drink like four light lagers i'll feel like shit the next day same with me. I, there's a time thing to it. There's a, there really yeah. is. Because if you go home at 10 o'clock and you start playing video games and you chill out, there's kind of this thing where you're obviously going to lose your buzz and it might be a little obnoxious and maybe a little like depressing, but it's better to go through that then and there than it is in the morning for sure. Yeah. And I do a lot yeah. of chewing tobacco, so it's kind of easy for me because I'll just throw a dipper in, enjoy the nicotine. What Play, do you get? Plays uh, Grizzly Long Cut Straight. Oh, shit. The one and only, yeah, I did for a long time. The only one I can I afford, yeah. But I'll play I Zelda. Uh, the pouches. You like the pouch? Was that the Zin? It's just nicotine. Yeah, it's just on. I got to figure something else out, though. I got to get the sunflower seeds. But um, I do love nicotine. I love chewing. I love that I can edit and put in dippers. It's almost kind of like, shoot, I can't even look at my footage today unless I have like a dipper in, which is the dumbest yep. thing you could ever have in your brain. But I just enjoy it. Um, 
back in the day, all the good riders, I'm not saying I'm a good rider or anything, but like they'd be inside just chain smoking cigarettes and, you know, have their ashtray right down in there. It's like, that is so goddamn disgusting in my world. Just be a grown man and put it in a dipper, dude, and just dip in your little fucking Snapple bottle or whatever and, you know, gross out every single girl that comes over to your house. Be a man. Be a man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just gross everybody out. Be a man. <laughs> it's with yeah. the plants grave. No, man, I like your grind. I definitely think you have a way more. I think you're probably the most, as, as far as entrepreneurship goes, I think you're the most interesting person who's ever been on the stream. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. Well, Thank it's you. typically homebrewers. It's typically um, like Adam makes beer as a commercial brewer. He's not an owner. I used to have a couple of owners come on. Jorge, it's kind of safe with him. It's a lot safer with Jorge. Um, I used to have uh, owners come on when I first started doing this and they were a little bit too, uh, too PR'd out kind of at a time when like it was COVID and stuff and they'd just be like, yeah, you know, put on a mask. Let's, we're all in this together. Trust the science, flatten the curve. And then they'd get off and they're like, dude, I fucking hate COVID. They're putting me on the streets. I like how many more bullshit rules are they going to have to shut my business down? This and that. So the owner thing kind of didn't make sense. I mean, I think it would make a lot more sense now, but there's still going to be a little bit more PR'd out. But you know, if you have an owner on and you get them drunk, they're going to be like, I fucking hate this employee. Fuck, you know, like they're really going to go for <laughs> yeah. it. And then it's going to be one of those things where like, I, you know, this is going to be entertaining, but this guy is going to hit me up in the morning and be like, Hey, can you take that down or this and that? So I think it's a safer yeah. bet. Well, I mean, for you, you don't, you're, you're a one man show. You can say whatever you want, you know, like you, I mean, do you even have like an HR department? I mean, what, what, what's the game plan for oh, no. <laughs> if there's a, if you're a one man band, do you even need HR? Do you need to pay like $150 yeah. a month for someone to be a third party thing? No. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, w whether I should or shouldn't is I, I'm, I'm uncertain, but no, I don't. And, but uh, more, more importantly, like I, I don't know. I just like. No, not PR, HR. Like I'm sorry. Transparent. Yeah, yeah, HR, HR. HR, sorry. My, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Human resources. But um, I don't know. I just like transparency. I, I, I've always liked to, anytime I have these conversations, like in private with other brewery folks or workers or owners or anything like that, like I, I'm just, I'm into having an open and transparent dialogue and not bullshitting about anything. Like if it, you know, if this aspect of the business sucks, it sucks. Like, dude, okay, now what? Move on. If I open up a Let's brewery, out. I would be exactly like you, except I'd be, I'd be drinking way more beer. Before. In those last four days, I would have like 800 beers. No, I really would. I'd probably have the same exact story. But as far as talking to other breweries and stuff, do you ever talk, do you ever do collabs? I, I, I have, uh, I did a lot more at Black Star and I've done a few here at Tanglefoot, but I'm pretty much done with collabs. I've got one more in the works right now, but. The problem with collabs with Tanglefoot is that these, I, I do such a specific style of uh, beer right. that right. any collab that we do is like, oh, let's do a Czech lager, right? Right. Well, I've done, you know, I have a 10 degree and a 12 degree pale lager, and I've done an 11 degree pale lager collaboration. I've done a 13 degree pale lager collaboration, and uh, like, it just, it, from a beer perspective, it's not, uh, it's not like I, there's a bunch of stuff I want to play around with. I don't really want to like try new hops or anything like that, but I would love to do more collaborations as, uh, Andy, the brewer, okay. not necessarily Tanglefoot. So I've considered doing some more, not, not like a secret, but like ghost collaborations that aren't necessarily with a, like tied to Tanglefoot, but like I've been brewing all kinds of styles for years. So. I'd be happy to do some cool new stuff with other people. Right. I'm tied to just check, check loggers. Yeah. I can understand how, you know, your, your beer menu, your style with Tanglefoot can kind of dry up pretty fast, you know? And at the end of the day, like if you go and look at, go to any brewery and you look at a collab, I'd say about 80% of it's just going to be IPAs anyways. And then maybe 20% is going to be probably a Pilsner. But for the most part, I think the collab game is an IPA thing. And A, you don't do IPAs. So B, they would have to just like 100% be on your page and on your level, you know? So I don't know. I, yeah. You see it, like it works for some people. You know, there's one brewery in Orange County. This guy, uh, I forgot his name. He looks like the dude from Workaholics with long hair. Artifacts. The name of the brewery is, is called Artifacts. 
And this guy is like the the grinder of collabs. The only reason yeah. people know about him, and the, or, uh, I'm not saying the only reason people know about him, and I don't, I don't, I would not want him to hear this, but he is the collab like monopoly guy. Like he has collabed with everybody in San Diego, up and down to LA, whether you're a big brewery or small brewery, and it's earned him a name for himself. It took him about five, ten years to get it going. But um, at that point, like, is it really about the beer or being like a salesman, you know? So it's kind of, I mean, I mean that's yeah, the Yeah, I mean, it depends on the goal. Like, I, I have uh, several friends in the industry that kind of, like, have either worked for a brewery or at their own brewery have just been, like, super heavy with collabs. And if you're interested in that, then do it. Go do them all day, and that's great. I just, my, my big hang-up with collabs and this was even before I started Tanglefoot was that initially they were really cool and helpful in that the whole point of a collaboration was to collaborate with ideas. So I come to your brewery and I learn something about your process and maybe take a piece back to my brewery and uh, vice versa. You learn something from me as a brewer and take yeah. it back to your brewery and we collaborate and we make something special together. And uh, I just saw, you know, with it's like it, the number of collaborations that end up being like, hey, let's collaborate on a beer. And then it's like, what it, the collaboration is we get to drink beer at 9 a.m. Yeah. And there's also like, th I'm trying to learn this now. You know, this is something I'm trying to begin to learn now. It's like, you can collab with YouTubers. I can collab with you and this and that. You know, it's like, hey, like we, who's really involved? Who's really brewing? Who's really filming? Like, who's really editing? You know, so you got to kind of figure out the, you know, the, the hours of that. But as far as like collabing with a brew tuber from here on out, I think the best course of action is just like, hey, just you're, I'm, I don't want to really uh, collab with the home brewer. I want to go to a commercial brewery and be like, hey, give me your recipe. I'm sure it's good. Now let me try to make it. And that was my first time I've ever done that. And this is a phenomenal beer. I mean, I, th I think it's phenomenal. It's still got a little hot burn. <clears throat> I did kind of fuck it up. I put too much hops in the, uh, <laughs> I put too much, I, I didn't <laughs> counter in for the Lupa, the Lupa Max hops. I was, um, I didn't even like notice that until like I was editing the video. I went back. I was like, oh yeah, everything's like double. You know, it's like the concentrated ones where they hit with um, I don't know. Uh, how do they do it? How do they? Um, what's the thing they like dry? Uh, they dry ice the hops and then they pretty much take out the lupulin, which is pretty oh, much yeah, like I think the it's, THC. Yeah, it's like CO two extraction. Yeah. So I was like, damn. And the beer's good, but I'm just I'm definitely tasting like too much hops in my mouth right now. I mean, it, it, the yeah. first. Beer was good. The second beer was good. The third one's like, you know, when you're, you go over to your buddy's house for the first time and he's brewing and you grab a couple hot pellets and you think it'd be cool to eat it. And you're just like, fuck, that was a bad idea. I'm kind of dealing with that right now. My third beer. So, um, yeah. yeah, pick and choose when you want to use those loop of max hops. And if you do use them, remember that you're using them. They're not, you know, yeah. use them the regular pellets. Yeah. But no, like I'm going to, like, um, do you know the apartment brewer, uh, Steve, do you ever watch his channel or seen his channel? I've definitely, I've Come across definitely it? Have seen some videos for sure. Cryo hops. Yeah, so, yeah, same vibe. Cryo hops, yeah. Lupo Max. Yeah. Everyone's kind of trying to like rebrand it, do their own thing. But, um, yeah, so he did, a. um, he tried to do, I don't know if I've seen a little bit of the, the couple minutes of the first part. But he did Treehouse's beer. Like, I want to hit up Treehouse, but like, hey, like, give me the recipe for the Orange Julius. Like, I want to, I want to make this, you know? And um, that way, like, they're not going to make my beer. We don't have to meet up. I would love to meet up, you know, but like, just give me the recipe and we'll call it like a collab and I'll use your logo and your name on the title. And that's kind of a YouTube collab. Like, leave it at that. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. If people are, are shy to give out their recipes to you, then that's weird to me. I think There's that's no secrets in the industry. And I agree with you. I, I think that's a super bad thing to do at this point. I think that back in the day it was like, Oh, no one can have my recipe. This and that. It's like, I fucking double dog dare you to try to like to give him that recipe to the T me and Noam and all of us talk about this all the time. Back in the day, I was like, I don't know if I want my recipes on the internet. I don't know if you want me shooting, you know, shooting your YouTube bullshit videos here. I was like, dude, you're looking at it the dead wrong way. Here's what's going to happen. Someone's going to make a beer more often than not. It's going to be a good homebrew and they're going to talk about yours. This is like the best freest promotion you could ever get. 
This is way better than a good Yelp review, a fucking badge on your untapped or whatever. Like someone's going to make a YouTube video, talk about it and like do like a blind taste contest and how, you know, this and that have it all. Here's all the keys to the city, all the, you know, down to the water chemistry. Um, so I'm with you a hundred percent on that. Yeah. It doesn't really, even like on a homebrew scale, it's, it's especially crazy. Cause like it, it, there's, it makes no sense not to offer that up to homebrewers, but even on a commercial scale, like the, the, the beers that I make here are so simple. It, it would like, it would blow your mind that like, it's, there's not that it's not crazy. There's no special ingredient. Yeah. There's no like secret thing that I do. It's very straightforward. Like I'm brewing on a glorified homebrew system and it's not, it's all about the execution. So even if another brewery right. takes this beer and right. brews it, like, right. Cool. Right. Go execution. Yeah. Execution, <clears throat> execution and fucking fresh ingredients are way bigger than the actual recipe itself. You know, like the recipe is like yeah, the, the least thing, you know, like the, the equipment, um, I don't know, man. It goes back to that whole thing. It's like you could have the best chef in the world, but give him like butter knives and he's still going to make way better food than like the average guy with like the nicest, uh, you know, sushi knives in the land and this and that. Execution experience will always prevail. No doubt about it. What up, Ryan? What up, Blackwood yeah, Brews? Well, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna fill up one more of these uh, 8.3% beers. Big love to Chris Vodka. Good to see Noam and uh, Jaggers are still hanging out. We're up to 42 people here right now. I know this is supposed to be a Wednesday thing. We lost him. Maybe his phone died. Looks like no. Michael. You're sorry. I, yeah, I, my I got like a call. Oh shit. We good to go? Yeah, I'm All here. Right. You see me? Yes, sir. Hold it down, Barrage. We're going in for one more. What up, Bruce? I'll be back. Nobody going anywhere. All right. Let's see. Is there anything else in this chat? Oh man. Well, anybody have any other questions in the chat? I can't see anything that uh, I'm scrolling up through here, but I, uh, yeah, it is Thursday, Bruce. So I think I have a lag on my YouTube video, but <clears throat> yeah, this is cool. Hanging out, chatting about beer. Um, sorry if I had any, uh, for my delayed connection earlier, the Discord was giving me some some major problems. Uh, da -da -da -da. Gnome Brewing, do you have do you brew a dark check? Yeah, yeah. So the 13 degree Tamave is a check dark lager. It was the best selling beer for the majority of the time that I was open. But uh, now the 12 degree and 14 degree have kind of outpaced that a little bit. But yeah, it's a super tasty, five percent full body or full flavored, medium bodied. Uh, Check dark logger. Anybody else? Dead air. No. I wasn't built for radio, but trying my best to fill some time here. Where's everybody from? This is uh, an eclectic group of people here in the stream. I've, I've jumped on the stream before in the comments uh, on the hoppy hour, but it seems like there's a variety of people out here in the comments. Where does the guy get updates?